Uh, hey, everybody. I am Paul Travers, the president of Vuzix Corporation. And uh, by way of a little bit of background, we've been at this for a long time. <laughs> Probably longer than most of the companies that are here. I, there's a few folks in the audience that know. Like 20 some odd years worth of wearable display technology kind of background. So we've seen a lot of stuff come and go. And part of my talk here is going to be why we believe things have changed. And successful deployments are happening now. And it's different than what it was like even just three years ago, quite frankly. The world's changing really fast. We have operations around the world today. We're out of Rochester, New York. We have a wonderful facility. We have great partners. And everybody's seen the predictions of millions of units being sold by X amount of date, et cetera. And I can tell you today that these verticals on the right-hand bottom side, warehousing, logistics, field service, construction, et cetera, these are places where augmented reality, wearable display technologies, hands-free computing effectively is making a difference. Everybody's seen the Gartner hype cycle curve, I'm sure. And it usually starts with this germ of an idea. Everybody gets super excited, so it goes into this peak of like, wow, this is amazing. And then reality strikes, which is sort of where we're at today. The only thing I would tell you is this has been happening up and down, up and down for the last 20, in my lifetime, five years <laughs> worth of right around the corner, it's going to come out of the trough of disillusionment. Or it's the coolest thing on the planet, but nobody's really making any money on it yet. There is a difference now. I do believe that we are approaching this other part of the curve now. And there's a reason for that. If you take a look back at the history of this industry, the devices that people have made, God bless them, we've been part of it, quite frankly. It's really a hard problem to solve. Wearable computing, as simple as it sounds, when you put a head-mounted display on a person and expect them to use it for eight hours a day, stuff like this doesn't work. They're great science experiments. We've made a lot of them ourselves. And the world of computers of the past, <laughs> as funny as this is, the people really did these kinds of things at first. The guy on the right there in my first business, I can remember I had a computer about like that, and I probably had a 10 megabyte hard drive in it. So, you know, these guys were pioneering, to say the very least, and we were part of it. This is all the way back in 1993 where Vuzix was making virtual reality head-mounted display systems. And back then, this was the Oculus of the day. In our first quarter, we shipped $6 million worth of product. Back then, that was a lot. We were in front covers of all these magazines. This is the beginnings of changing the world, and it was 20-some-odd years ago. And it's still going through lots and lots of changes, and it's, I'm happy to say, finally starting to get there. We've made these kinds of devices for years. And one of the things I will tell you is most every one of these devices, as cool as we thought they were, they still needed something else to plug into. So you had a headset, and then you had a backpack computer, and, or you had something else. I mean, it was big, kludgy stuff. And to expect somebody to actually use this for an eight-hour day to solve a problem, get something done, accomplish something with ROIs, without sending the guy home with a headache the first hour of using it, is, it was a challenge. Four years ago or so, maybe four plus years ago, Vuzix introduced our first smart pair of smart glasses. And we talked about the 10 megabyte hard drive on the beast. <laughs> this thing, you could put 32 gig in it. The CPUs are built in. They run at gigahertz speeds, little tiny displays. This was the beginnings of our business anyway, people looking and saying, hey, wait a minute. This actually could be used as a hands-free computing device. I'm not talking about you know, augmenting the space around you. I'm talking about giving people directions to get something done and get an ROI for having done that. Now, as cool as this was, there was all kinds of issues about this product. People still buy it today. There's places where it works really, really well. But we learned a lot from it. Music's introduced our M300 one and a half, two years ago. Can't remember exactly, something like that. And we learned a lot from the M100. We put it a lot of experience from the M100 into the M300. And with it, we've also built an ecosystem. So in order to be successful with these kinds of devices, I'm going to give you guys the things that we see happening to drive success. And I'm going to give you an example. But it's the kind of things that you see on this page that help make this happen. This is more internal to Vuzix. 
I'm here to say also that the people that are going to deploy this, if you plan on doing it, you need a team of folks that believe in it and want to get behind it at the same time. Because you have to change the way your company works a little bit. But you'll see in the end here, it's well worth it if you take the time to do this right. So for Vuzix, we have a little app store. We have tier one through tier tier support. We have a slew of accessories that make it very, very easy to deploy our devices today. They are lightweight, they're wearable, et cetera. And we keep pioneering, pushing the envelope, and trying to get these devices lighter and lighter weight and closer and closer to what people would wear in what you might consider normal kinds of devices. These glasses are 2.8 ounces, super lightweight, optical see-through systems, the computers, everything built in. They're really pretty revolutionary. If you get a chance, stop by our booth. I think you'll enjoy playing with them. So with these changes, with the kinds of devices that Vuzix is bringing to market, with the ecosystems that we've built, we are seeing proven outcomes. Our revenues are climbing on an annual basis, on a quarterly basis, and it's one with some of the biggest players and small companies at the same time. So we see kind of three major areas that you have to kind of get right and think through. The hardware's one. There's certainly a software component to all of this. And quite frankly, there's a mindset of the people that are adopting this. So on the, soft, on the hardware side, to us anyway, the first thing you have to ask yourself is could you expect your employee to wear this device for an eight-hour day, a typical eight-hour work day. We've been working very hard at Vuzix to make the devices lightweight, small enough, light enough to wear so that you can go through a comfortable day. And I would suggest, if you look at the guy on the left, that's a Vuzix device, it has all kinds of accessories. It'll work with hard hats, left eye, right eye dominant people, uh, safety glasses, prescriptions, We've tried to cover the base so that when an IT department or somebody in the warehouse wants to deploy it, they've got the tools in their accessory kit to just deploy this thing, problem solved. Some of these other devices are great for other kinds of use cases. Most of them, if you look at them, are not really an, an all-day wearable device, <laughs> but they can get things done. I'd be the first guy to say it, and they're very exciting. We think it's you know kind of early adopter kinds of devices still, though. Um, their guy on the right, wonderful device also. He, they fit very close into the paradigm of how we see the solutions working in this marketplace. Software. It's wonderful to think that one day we're going to have dinosaurs running down the street and all that sort of stuff. But that's not the kind of stuff people need at work. When you're at work, you need applications that help you get a job done. And so you don't need massive fields of view wrapping the AR world into the real world. What you need are work instructions and the like. And so the software partners that you work with and the solutions that you need are about ROI use cases. You really need the use case down in the software to solve it, not necessarily some of this other stuff. And then it's you guys. If you're going to deploy this stuff, it helps that somebody at the top is saying, we're going to do this. And you'll see in a few minutes what I mean by this. You need the employees super excited to be part of it. And I can tell you, some of the companies that we work with, the folks that are wearing these things kind of feel like the supermen of the company. They're wearing the cool new tech. They're like special forces guys. They are also getting the benefits of doing this. They're working hard. They're deploying new stuff. There's ROIs for the company. And often, that gets supported back down into the employee base. And if it does, the odds of success go up. And then you need use cases that make sense. And there's a ton of them out there today. And there's a ton of partners that work with Vuzix that are helping drive the software solutions in those use cases. And then to kind of back up that whole executive sponsorship, the wait and see attitude, I can tell you that if you're not thinking about doing this kind of stuff today, you're probably missing out on bottom line and top line numbers for your company already. And there's all kinds of excuses lack of time to invest in research, technical challenges, but I'm telling you, if you get behind this, you guys can make a big return for your company. Top and bottom line, the bottom line here is you need ecosystems, you need partners delivering the software, system integrators, tool providers to have these things, mobile device managed, et cetera, et cetera. And when you put all of this together, you end up with the ability to deploy successful solutions. And what I want to do here is give you a case-in-point study. SATS 
Singapore Air out of Changi Airport is the place where they're, they're doing this particular deployment. And I'm going to let this video run to speak for itself to explain to you what's happening here. With air travel soaring, competition inside airports is also picking up. Ground handlers like SATs are fighting hard to get contracts. This week on Managing Asia, we check in with CEO Alex Hyundai. The rain didn't dampen the spirit of Alex Hyundai. The CEO showed me the action behind the scenes at SATs, Singapore's biggest airport ground handler and caterer. You can see the driver now. It's a big piece of machinery, very powerful engine. So to have hands-free is very important. And he can check the uh, ULD labeling, okay. the augmented reality. So of all of these different ULDs which are on the runway, uh -huh. these are the ones which he knows are for his flight. So very quickly he can see them. Much safer, much more How productive. long does it take to load up, usually, typically? Uh, we turn the whole round thing around in 30 minutes now. Okay. Um, it used to take a bit longer, so this is a good uh, improvement. Just two, two main doors. Okay. It's the same main deck loader will service both. Okay. If it's an A380, you can talk about five doors and you've got two main deck loaders. Okay. So these are your people and from your glasses, you can see all this through your glasses and yes. you would be able to load everything in. Yeah, and the control room as well okay. can also see, which is great. Breaking out of the box, Hange hacked the status quo by loading sats up with the latest tech, like smart glasses to speed up operations. Well, you can see the vision here on the screens of what they're seeing through the glasses. As they view the ULDs on the runway, it will automatically, using color coding, tell them which ULDs are due for their flight mm -hmm. and which ULDs they shouldn't touch and leave alone. This is very important because each one weighs different amounts. So our load control team is making sure the plane is balanced. If you put a heavy one in the, in the place where a light one's meant mm -hmm. to be, of course, that can be a safety issue. Mm -hmm. So this is a fail-safe method where this loading plan here... And this is what you see on your glasses? Yes. This loading plan here tells them where they need to place their next container. And that is scientifically the result of our load control team doing a weight and balance analysis of the plan. So obviously it cuts down on paperwork, it cuts down on loading time? Yes. Loading time is critical because sometimes if a connecting plane doesn't make it, the passenger load is different than what the original planner thought. So in this method, immediately the load control can adjust in real time and say, OK, this container, uh, which would have been there, now needs to go one back to compensate for that. And that, this is all real time. In the old days, they would have to get a new piece of paper. They go back to control room, mm. new piece of paper on the clipboard, and then uh, start again. He won CNBC's Asia Disruptor of the Year Award in 2017, recognized for his efforts in cracking the code. That's what I call getting senior support from the executives of the company to help make this happen. And when you see the last slide I'm going to play for you is the bottom line of what this means for SATS and their employees. This is a big deal for these guys. So their goal was to make it a paper hands-free solution that they could change on the fly from the control center up top. You heard him kind of describe this whole, well, the plane lands, the other plane didn't get there, so they got to rebalance the plane on the fly. Literally, they had these, I don't remember, you guys remember the 9mm dot print matrix re, 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 kind of thing. So you can imagine that, and they're running them out to the flight line, and they're like this chaotic mess. So they, they don't do that anymore here. It's all digitalized, the entire process. It's a fail-safe method to load baggage, and it's, the user interfaces are simple. One of the things I'm not sure if you noticed, but when they looked at the side of the pallets, the ULDs, on the side of them, they're now using QR codes. So I'm standing 50 feet away. There's a QR code on the side of the device. And it tells me by looking at it, there's a virtual, hey, this is where I go inside the plane. So the user doesn't have to do this and look and try to find the thing on the side of the pallet. It's just labeled. And digitally, while he's looking at it, they can say, wait, put that in third instead of second. So these things just happen on the fly. Simple, easy to use, and the users actually like it. Like I said, they feel like supermen. I got the really cool gear on, right? So SATS, they're a leading provider of these gateway services. They're in 60 airports. They offer and do a whole lot of other things in the airline industry. And they are expanding this technology, not just for turning around planes on the gates. There's many places these folks are planning to use it. It took them about a year. The pilot started a little bit more than a year ago in 2017. 
they just kicked off the first 600 pieces are now um, on the gates with uh, 600 plus ramp handling staff in the Changi Airport. So it's, it's a really cool case study of what really can happen today with devices that exist today that can go to work for an eight hour shift. Corporate sponsorship at the highest level, if you get behind it, these things can happen. Smart glasses are now part of the standard ramp handling operations and it cuts turnaround time by 15 minutes. No, 15 minutes. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of airplanes. Over the United States at any given time, there's maybe 50,000 airplanes flying. 15 minutes at the gate is huge. And the bottom line. You earlier mentioned 30% of your costs, mostly comes from labor. To what extent could you reduce that in future? Yeah, I think um, the revenues can continue to grow and the costs should also grow, but probably no more than in line with revenue. So uh, I, I fully expect that we'll pay our people more. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. Uh, as our people become more productive, they embrace technology. I want to pay them more. Um, and I tell the unions this too. I want to pay them more. But we have to obviously generate the productivity improvements to be able to do that. If I can pay them more, I can get the more talented people. I can also get the people who are most passionate about service. And their experience will help because still in airports there are mm -hmm. unexpected things that happen. And you need that experience of the, the human touch, the experience to be able to uh, improvise at the right moments. It's about the people. It's about the devices, the software, the ecosystem. But in the end, when it all comes together, there are, there are big changes that are happening. And it's not like the hype cycle that I've seen for years and years. These things are really being deployed. This is one example. We have many others that we will be unveiling to the world here in 2018 and into 2019. It's an exciting time to be in this industry. After 20 some odd years of pushing the rope, we're all starting to get there. So that's music in a nutshell. Uh, I guess there's this Aggie Award thing. So if you guys want to vote for winners, we'd like to be one of them. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, Paul, you ready for some Q&As? Yes, I am. Okay, let's go on right for the first one. When we should wait, when we should wait for a new mode of glasses for corporate business instead of M300? So the, 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 base, the, the normal question, should I buy it now yeah. or wait for the next update? Why wait? <laughs> the fact is, these things are available now. It is very true. Vuzix is on a really cool path of building next generation stuff. But this stuff works really, really well today. The, it's been worked out. The, the accessories, if you come visit Jordy, my salesman here in Europe, but sitting here in the front row, the guy leading it there, he'll share with you. It's an entire ecosystem, a solution for people. It works well. And I can tell you that the next generation products that we're building slide right into this same sort of form. So I would not wait. If it was me and I wanted to start realizing a top and bottom line change to my company, I'd be looking at deploying immediately. OK, oh, this one question just like disappeared because it's always like by popularity. Um, why IR in one eye only? Yeah, in one eye only. So these are applications where you're working amongst equipment everywhere. There's things happening. There's situational awareness that you have to be very cognizant of. The whole idea of, again, I, and I, I really love the idea of whales and dinosaurs and all that sort of stuff. But this is not about putting this massive immersive information in a real world situation. This is about snippets of information to help you get your job done in a safe fashion. So you don't, shouldn't look at this as if it's one eye. You should look at it as it's like the speedometer on your car that you look down at when you need to do something, but typically it's not in the way. Now our optical see-through systems happen to work the same way. Mm -hmm. We have binocular and monocular systems, but in environments like this, it's often about just next, next, next. And you don't need this giant immersive environment to be in, in a binocular sense. You really want this stuff out of the way and just move to the next. Other than part. that, you should go back to like a screen if you just want to have more information and more to be filled yes. in front of you. There are efforts that require the more information thing. Mm. I would, you know, like a whole panel, but this is an Excel spreadsheet and it's not looking at websites. The XM Reality gentlemen that were just up, 
you saw they were looking at something and there was a hand pointing do this next thing and you can do that in a small window and go do it and get the stuff out of the way to make it happen so a single monocular device lightweight wearable all day is way more important than having a great big bulky thing on that is binocular in both eyes. But, so that means that one day, if everything becomes like lighter, then there's a chance to have even like a 3D immersion of, of things in front of you? Because we, that could be... Sure. Uh, that. We see a day. Did you see the movie The Kingsman? Yeah. We're going to make those glasses of music. That stuff is coming, but the technology needs to improve more and more before it's ready for that. Okay. Although we're getting closer and closer. Today, though, the most important thing is ROIs in a work environment safely. And these monocular lightweight devices do a really good job of doing that. OK. And oh, here's the question back. Do you have any plans to offer ATEX rated smart glasses that can be used in dangerous environments like offshore oil and gas? Yes. <laughs> good. <laughs> oh, I like they say in Swedish, tuck. <laughs> Music Blade, better than Magic Leap? Different than Magic Leap. We have a lot of respect for the Magic Leap guys. Their stuff is really cool. but. We are trying to solve, I think, different problems than what they're trying to solve. I mean, I think maybe in the long run we converge on things that start to look the same. But our focus has been, we're an enterprise company mostly. I will admit the blade's going to be a lot of fun to play with. We have some really cool applications. Uh, you, there's a dinosaur hunt game where you shoot dinosaurs and stuff. And, but that's not what the devices are about. They're, enterprise, they're tools, that you put them to work in a warehouse and in environments where, you know, you, you really need to be very cognizant of what's around you. And our optical systems and everything were designed for that. Magic Leap is trying to do something else. I, I'm, I'm not here to promote or otherwise Magic Leap. It's just a, it's a different device. But I understand, like, demonstrating it sometimes must be kind of difficult. Sometimes you need some games so that people have an idea what is possible. But then enterprises feel like, well, ah, that's, like, too much of a game. The games can show things like, look at how good the tracking is. And look at how amazing it is to have these experiences out in front of you. But the Blade is not really about that. I will tell you, though, we have people that have golf balls with Bluetooth connectivity and them hooked up to the Blade. And so when you swing, it's telling you how good. So there's... Enter there's prosumer and gaming and all those kinds of things that will happen around the blade, but they're $1,000 a piece. They're really pointed at the prosumer and the lightweight enterprise kinds of operations. You know, you're, we have a company up in northern New York. They're a grocery store, and they're using these to help folks pick groceries in a cart, bring it to the guy. When he pulls up on the curve, he gives them his groceries. You don't want people in the, walking around the store even with their magic leap on, looking <laughs> all weird, walking around uh, you know, a grocery store, scaring the patrons. So these glasses look much more like a normal pair of glasses. Mm -hmm. And they're pointed at those kinds of environments and opportunities. OK. Going for the next one, what is the autonomy, the battery life of Usix Blade currently? So the Blade has been designed so it is off until you need it to use it. And it's got an application that we're releasing by the end of October mm -hmm. that is tied to your phone as a companion app. So all of the information that comes in through your phone comes up as heads-up display information in the glasses, like your watch. It's off a lot. You're walking down the street, a Pokemon Go character comes up, bzz, phone wakes up, there's a vibrating motor in the backside, tells you to look right, and you go catch the Pokemon Go guy. If you're doing that kind of stuff, you can get, you know, maybe an eight-hour day out of it. If you're chasing Pokemon Go <laughs> constantly, or you're doing streaming video services with them, et cetera. Uh, the battery life is maybe an hour, hour and a half, but we have ba collar batteries that are coming out for it, and you can put pocket batteries on it to extend the battery life to go for days if you wanted to. OK. So uh, that, it depends on the use case. As I thought so. I mean, how heavy will these battery packs be, like the neck one and the one for the pocket? The one in the pocket is light like a phone sort of a thing. They're not that heavy. OK. Regarding the SAT cases, what's the fail safe if the system isn't working? Is the paper trail completely eliminated? I don't know all of SAT's backup side of this. I can tell you, though, they have a few extra of our devices. And when airports network systems go down, they typically shut down the airport. <laughs> I'm not saying that's us. but. These systems are part of those same systems. So if the airport isn't running, it probably doesn't matter because you're not flipping vehicles and planes in and out. But as long as those systems are up, they have plenty of equipment. 
okay. to make sure that they're operational. And coming back to the ad techs rated smart classes, are they available or is there still a plan? I think this is like and this is the a tax question. Yeah, yeah, like coming back pretty much. Yeah. I really, I really can't get into that just yet. I can tell you that it is something that's definitely in the Vuzix roadmap. That's as far as I can say, though. Okay. So that's it for the ATX rated one. Whenever another yep. question comes up, yep. we know about it. How many glasses do you plan to sell in Europe in 2019? So now let's. <laughs> We're a public company. Let's talk business. <laughs> yes. It's hard for me to answer that question. I can only tell you that our business is, is double and tripling on an annual basis right now. And some of the companies that we're dealing with, the, the numbers are surprisingly large how it's changing. It's, we're not talking about now, two years ago, you know, if we got a 50 unit deployment, it was like, wow, that was, these guys are really doing something. This SATS is an order of magnitude greater than that in one airport. They're in 60 airports through Asia. So you, you can imagine that kind of change in this industry. That first slide where I talked about, or third slide maybe, we talked about by 2025 in America alone, 14 million smart glasses. I believe this business is headed for that kind of change. In Europe in 2019, it's going to be bigger in 2018. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about it then the next year again. Do you, uh, okay, how, okay, how do your glasses know the user's context where they are? Yeah. So in some cases, they have a GPS built in if you're in outdoor operations. But many of these systems are used in environments where there's either the phone can be used as a GPS for localization if you happen to be walking outdoors. And in fact, the way the Blade operates today, the companion app that's running on the phone is actually a link to a lot of the services that are on the phone up to the glasses. So you can be walking down the street and the phone's got Google Maps running and it says hang us right 500 feet from now, and that just comes up in the glasses, geospatially aware. Since there's sensors, et cetera, in the glasses, you know the direction that you're looking, so you can adjust that information. So if you're looking this way, it can say hang a right. If you're looking this way, it can say hang a left at 500 feet sort of stuff. So mm -hmm. there's sensors everywhere, glasses and the devices that you're typically plugged into. And uh, what about the plan to lower the price of your devices to make them available for the Soho segment? Well, you know, we're at a thousand bucks right now. <laughs> That's one of the least expensive smart glasses, I think, in the marketplace today with our blade. And I would hazard to guess the blade's the sexiest pair that's out there. I'm biased, of course, but so it's a good price. I will tell you that as the volume picks up and these next generation systems that we're working on with folks like Qualcomm, you know, these things are going to be able to be like cell phone style prices. I said, Apple, is setting the bar there these days, and you know their phones are thousand plus dollar kinds of phones. So, I would suggest that in the early adopter, high end of the market, these devices are already starting to be in that space. Twenty five hundred bucks, a lot of money, no doubt about it. But this is a thousand dollars and under. That's that's getting in the zone. All right, then that sums up our Q and A, ladies and gentlemen. Paul Travers from Music. Thank Uzi. you, everybody. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.